So I'd like to talk about noise and how we look at noise in MOSFETs. And this is sort of, sort of an overview, sort of perspective on a couple key things that you usually need to pay attention to when just starting to talk about noise in MOSFETs. Now, I'm going to say that this really comes out of sort of the fundamental work that um, I had over a couple years in the mid '90s um, that came out of that came that was by Raul Sharpeskar, Telby Dilbrook, and Carver Mead, and they did some really good work on this um, in the in these sort of time frames. And there's a lot of different pieces and parts to it, uh, although. Certainly, there's a couple classic papers, and I would strongly encourage you to actually see the, and go through those papers. And a lot of this got summarized in Raul Sharpesker's uh, PhD thesis in 97. Um, and so this gives you a lot of things that you can make sense of there. The thing to understand, to start with, is that we're going to first talk primarily about thermal noise. And thermal noise is the kind of main part if you look at noise in general, if you're looking at, you know, looking at it on a measurement, particularly on, on, a, on a spectrum analyzer, it'll look relatively flat with frequency. Okay, so it's kind of meant, it sort of has this characteristic that's pretty much flat, and that's kind of how people think about it, and there's kind of that assumption made when you do this. All right, so what's interesting about it is, well, where does it come from physically? Well, it comes from basically looking at charge going through a piece of material and you realize that there's some variability of where it's going to end up going between one point to another and that and over a particular time there's some variability and that's going to be because of randomization going through that material in a sort of net effect you're thinking it's going constantly through but there's going to be some variation there okay so you look at it for one electron and then you look at it for another electron you assume all the electrons are independent and this independence is very important through almost all of the typical math you do for noise. And then when you say, if I have a whole bunch of them that are independent, I can add up all of the variance together. And you'll typically talk about the noise is really the variance of the variance of the current. And we talk about in current is that that noise, that variance of the current, again, I could think about all those electrons being added up that are adding independently. And so variances add up linearly. This is really important to remember that I can take any all the variances, add them up. It's basically going to end up being 2q, which is kind of the core thing per one electron. It usually be 2q squared for a single one, time sort of, you know, related to inverse of the time of the transit. Well, and it'd be 2q squared. Well, of course, if I have n of those independently, I actually end up having the current that comes through this. And so what ends up happening is it's 2qi times delta F. And so this actually gives me something, and I, if you look at the units, it's actually units of current squared. Because F is one over time, you get a Q there. So you get something that is in fact, you know, a variance. So it's a variance, um, it's a variance squared. And it comes out of N independent electrons. This is the fundamental expression. And for thermal noise, this is a fundamental expression, period in terms of any noise currents that you're looking at. And it's going to be based on, I have a course of a current going in a direction and I look at the noise around it. Okay, a couple things to think about um, that are going to be important. If I had two noise sources, well, I end up adding the variance, because again, the noise sources should be independent. Assuming they are independent, this is how it would add up. Not always are they independent, but mostly always they are. And sometimes if you're building circuits, you'll notice that two things are actually sort of already correlated. You can use that to kind of to your advantage sometimes. Differential pairs are a good example. Um, interestingly enough, if it turns out that the two of them are identical, then it basically just means that that noise increases by a square root of two. But it's still, it's kind of how you have to think about it. And then when you start putting this into circuits, and often you're going to be dealing with small signal models for this, you're kind of dealing with small signal models. But wait, I've got to deal with the, the noise currents differently. So just always be aware of that. There's also this conversation of what is the total noise, which is then saying, let me look at the behavior over, a, over the entire range of frequencies, like integrate from zero to infinity over frequency. And so there's a different discussion between what is the noise or the instantane or sort of noise per unit bandwidth, noise per root hertz is the way you talk about it, versus total noise. 
And so that's typically what we're going to see in terms of device. And so typically we'll see thermal noise, and thermal noise is just going to be constant. Now you'll also see 1 over F noise, and this has to do a lot with channel interface collisions. It's primarily just characterized. You usually define this by basically one parameter. You look at your process, you just pick it. 1 over F noise comes primarily because you're getting collisions with the interface, and there's sort of a trapping and detrapping, so it means that there's sort of a randomness of when things are sort of maybe getting stuck and then getting pushed back out in the transport. MOSFETs typically have more of this than, say, BJTs or other sort of bulk devices, and this is like the primary thing with MOSFETs that you have to pay attention to. Now, it's not always a problem, and in particular, depending on uh, how you approach it, it may not be much of an issue. Um, it also, where this crossover point will depend a lot on what current levels you're looking at and what you're looking at for a particular device. It's not, sometimes this cordless crossover will be at 10 hertz, sometimes it could be at a megahertz, and it all depends on how you built your circuit. Do not assume, oh look, I've got a circuit that's sitting at one kilohertz, therefore it must be one over F dominated. No, not clearly true at all. Depends a lot on the artistry and the approach of the circuit designer. Okay. But then I get to a different question in terms of MOSFETs, and there's actually something very profound of this. And this was something that um, was really important with some of the work that, that Raul Scherfesker looked at um, in terms of understanding this for MOSFETs. Because if you look at a MOSFET, your effective current is actually two currents. Right? There's a forward and reverse current. So in sub-threshold, there's the current that's going over the source to channel barrier. There's also the current going over, this, over, the, drain to, over the drain to channel barrier. And you might think of those as forward and reverse. Well, you go, great, so no problem. I have an effective current, and that's going to be equal to, you know, I can then look at what is the forward and reverse current parts of it. Normally, you think of those two components subtracting each other. But here, I need to actually add them together because they can both, they can both add into the conversation. So yes, I get the 2Q delta F. I get sort of the typical gate terms pull out of there. But then I get say this is on first source, I'm going to assume this is at ground, just like we define this term here, and then my drain voltage, or in this case V, is going to be sitting there. Now they're added together. This is a little different function than you're typically used to, because you're usually used to this being a minus sign for the current behavior, and that would typically mean when I get to the drain voltage is equal to zero, it's no current, and when I'm at High enough drain voltage, it's pretty much a constant current source. Well, what does this function look like? Well, it actually looks like, let's say, a 10, you know, 10 nanoamp re saturation reference current. The number I'd see here is about, you know, about 0.56 picoamp is the current, is the noise currents. And you're like, oh, okay, I've got a decent, you know, that's pretty much going to be flat. Um, obviously not worrying about sigma channel-like modulation here. But then as I get towards zero volts, all of a sudden it actually goes up and it actually doubles actually at that point. In fact, there's a four in here, so I get twice the noise power. So this coefficient is really important to kind of notice that's relevant. Um, it's really important because if I'm operating things in the Ohmic regime, which there are places where that's something I really want to do, I have to understand that I'm getting more noise, significantly more noise, and lower signal. And I better be able to handle this. So anytime, and, and, and the corollary to this is if I build look at resistors, um, there is an equivalence, and again, you, for those who are astute will notice there's a four in the res, most of the resistor kind of noise equations. It's really a case of I've got forward and backward noise canceling each other. And I get exactly the sort of power of two that shows up as a result. And so it makes sense. It's also, by the way, for those who like to do computation and they say, Oh, great, let me try to emulate resistors because that'll be great, let's say, in a crossbar. Um, what you've done is you put yourself actually in a high noise place uh, and made your signal small. This doesn't work. This is not where you would want to go rather than just shift it over a little bit and it works fine. Now, maybe you're getting your inspiration from some other resistive element and I would just simply say start with MOSFETs and continue. It'll make your life a lot easier. Um, and so this is what you end up seeing. This would be kind of true for any three terminal device, four terminal device, you know, voltage control barrier structure. 
You'd see a similar kind of issues with DJTs. Um, this is fairly general, and it's pretty important to kind of get these basic noise concepts in a good place for any of the other related sort of circuits and, and analysis you might do with these elements.